Good evening and good morning, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, for tonight's event at the Courtauld's Research Forum. My name is uh, Pia Gottschaller. I am a senior lecturer at the Courtauld Institute and I am joined um, just for the moment by Sanna Gilbert, who is my colleague at the Getty Research Institute and she is a senior research specialist there. Sana will, in a few minutes, introduce our other speakers tonight. Um, but before we get to that, let me briefly tell you how uh, the evening is going to unfold. Uh, Sana and I will give you a brief introduction to what the book is about and uh, give you a sort of basic idea of the various themes and issues. Uh, this will be followed by a 30-minute conversation between the five of us on a number of subjects that are raised by the book. Um, and towards the end, uh, Ricardo, who's our resident artist tonight, um, and I will have a more in-depth conversation about some of his work. And at about 7.45, we will open the floor to questions from you, and we encourage you to post them in our chat function. And we shall be um, done with everything by about eight o'clock. So first, let uh, me tell you a little bit about the book. And before I do that, hold on, let me start sharing the screen because we've got some images for you. Okay. All right, there we are. So the volume Purity is a Myth focuses on the fascinatingly heterogeneous histories of concrete artists, material practices, to open up entrenched histories, not only of modernism in Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay, but also of canonical understandings of abstraction. In this project, technical material analysis, archival research, and visual examination of the artworks themselves were combined to recover a history of abstraction beyond the so-called purity and autonomy of Greenbergian modernism. That was a funny sound. Great. Uh, the abstraction we delved into with the help of a host of brilliant scholars, and we've um, you know, put everybody's name together here on the slides, just so you have an idea of who's represented and who's got written wonderful essays for us um, in this book. So these, this abstraction we all delved into was found to be interdisciplinary, often explored through activities as diverse as poetry, dance, and design, and interested in a broad artistic practice that owed much to the Bauhaus and Swiss models of abstract inquiry. The research project that led to this volume encompassed four research teams, each one made up of art historians, conservators, and conservation scientists in the US, Argentina, and Brazil. In the US, the project was co-led by the Getty Research and Conservation Institutes and was funded by the Getty Foundation. This team's study focused on 46 works in the collection of Patricia Phelps de Cisneros, a selection of which was also exhibited at the Getty Center in 2017-18 as part of the Getty's Pacific Standard Time LALA initiative. The Museum of Fine Arts Houston studied their impressive collection of works donated by Adolfo Lerner, and the teams at LACICO, the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Belo Horizonte, and at Tarea, the National University of San Martin in Buenos Aires, studied a range of artworks in public and private collections. Okay, let me show you some of the pages. In recent years, materiality has become a central field of investigation in the humanities in what has become known as the so-called material term. As an art form that often claimed to, quote, begin and end with itself, end of quote, as the concrete artist Rod Rotfuss put it in 1944, concrete art is particularly apt for material study. The term concrete was coined by the Dutch artist Theo van Doesburg in 1930 to denote abstract painting with no reference to external reality. Concrete art would be simple, exact in technique, and shaped in the mind before its execution. And what you're seeing here is a prime example of the so-called Marco Recortado, or you know, in an artwork with irregularly shaped uh, outline. And uh, we will, 
you know, talk about more about um, these particularly important inventions of the Argentine conquest um, a little bit later. The concreteness of this type of art, however, invariably pointed to the importance of the material object as generator of theoretical reflection and knowledge, phenomenological sensation, or a gestalt process of perception. Above all, the work itself was participant in the reality of the spectator. And indeed, this focus on materiality emphasizes what Argentine concrete artists intimated from the very beginning with their own distinct conception of the artwork within a Marxist materialist framework, that objects have agency and can be considered actors in the ongoing construction of social reality. So now I'm handing over to Zana. Hello, good morning, everyone. So um, one of the most surprising insights that resulted from this extensive technical study of these artworks was that the somewhat homogenous visual appearance of the artworks uh, didn't correspond with an equally homogenous process of creation. Um, in fact, the range of materials, techniques, and processes used uh, varied considerably, not only from group to group and country to country, but uh, from artist to artist, and in many instances um, within the artist's own oeuvre. So um, there was no reason to assume that concrete and neo-concrete artists were any less uh, individualistic in their approach to art making than any other artist, but their strident, often strident language in their manifestos suggested um, a unified artistic project from conception to realization, and from philosophy to materiality. Um, when we talk about materiality, we also have to consider absent materialities, um, such as those um, works produced by Argentine and Ur Uruguayan artists in cardboard, um, which as a number of our authors have noted, um, are no longer available to study due, uh, due to their precarious nature and the radical posture of the artist's experimentation. Uh, the essays in Purity is a Myth shed light on the early origins of concretism, uh, on generative processes uh, that the artists use, on the artist's idiosyncratic use of color, their engagement with printed matter, poetry and design, um, and uh, thorough technical studies and studies of the paint industry. Um, Oita Seeker's 1967 title for his penetrable PN2, Purity is a Myth, um, we felt was a fitting maxim for this volume uh, that seeks to reveal the heterogeneous material practices of, of concrete artists. Um, we're very honored to have um, three esteemed interlocutors here with us tonight to analyze issues raised by the book, to think about future research avenues um, that arise from it, and to consider the relation of this work to broader histories of abstraction. Um, so I'll now introduce our three speakers. Lynn Cook has been Senior Curator Special Projects in Modern Art at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. since 2014. She was previously Deputy Director and Chief Curator at the Museo Reina Sofia in Madrid from 2008 to 2012, and Curator at the Dia Art Foundation in New York from 1991 to 2008. She's written extensively on contemporary art, including on the work of Zoe Leonard, Frances Alice, Agnes Martin, and James Castle. She's currently curating Braided Histories, Modernist Abstraction, and Woven Forms, scheduled for the autumn of 2023, which we look forward to very much. Uh, Bryony Fur is an art historian who's written extensively on modern and contemporary art. Her research interests have consistently moved between the history of the avant-garde and the work of contemporary artists, including also Zoe Leonard, Gabriella Rosco, Ronnie Horn, B.A. Salmons, and Tacita Dean. Her books uh, on abstract art, The Infinite Line, Eva Hesse Studio Work, and Gabriella Orozco, Thinking in Circles. Um, she co-curated the Annie Albers retrospective with Maria Muller Sharik and Anne Coxton at Tate Modern and K20 Dusseldorf in 2018. She is professor of art history at University College London and a fellow of the British Academy. 
And last but not least, Ricardo Alcaide is currently based in Antwerp. Though hailing from Venezuela, he lives in Sao Paulo for 15 years until recently. He makes work around the memory of modernism and its deviation in the contemporary context in Latin America. With his own personal analytical approach of socio-political and cultural aspects, Alcaide makes connections through his immediate surroundings with found objects as a reflection of ever-growing waste caused by progress. His minimal abstract work focuses on materiality, resulting in a complex formal conflict between his search for harmony and traces of chaos within the uses of the material as metaphor. So thank you all um, for being here and generously uh, agreeing to discuss uh, the contents of this book. So we wanted to open the discussion um, by talking about the work that's featured on the cover. Um, Eliza Edelman writes wonderfully about Judith Lawan's um, unorthodox concretism um, in that she moved away from Valdemar Cordero's austere and quite dogmatic um, approach. Um, as you know, through our study, we realized many concretists uh, did. Um, but this work, uh, this um, needlepoint tapestry, as she called it, um, it, is a kind of mist or perhaps a repressed history. Um, but we chose it, the work for the cover, because it gives us this sort of tantalizing view of a broader uh, material inventiveness of the concretists, um, their use of um, paints, their um, cooking up of their own paints, and um, the different techniques that they used, which kind of called on a broader Bauhaus or Swiss tradition of, of multidisciplinarity. Um, and we wanted to think about this kind of uh, missed history in a way, um, and in particular um, relating to women and textiles and abstraction, seeing as we have uh, Lynn and Bryony here. Um, so we, we wanted to start by asking uh, Lynn and Bryony um, to tell us a little bit about their work with women and textiles and how this opens up um, different understandings of abstraction. And Lynn, if you don't mind going first. Um, well, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Sana. One of the things that struck me as I was reading essays in this book was how anomalous this work seemed. There didn't seem to be anything like it. And uh, given the preoccupations with making art that was uh, overtly contemporary in its relation to the latter part of indust the industrial society, the mechanized world. Um, needlepoint, of course, is a, is a very ancient technique. And so not only did it strike me because of its gendered nature and its relationship to women's domestic labor, um, but it's, um, I suppose one could say, it's anachronism within this um, set of discourses. But of course, what we're finding more and more, I think in recent scholarship and the wonderful Sophie Toiber Arp show at the Museum of Modern Art now demonstrates very vividly is that um, or the origins of abstract art are perhaps wider than canonical abstract uh, art history would tell us. And certainly there's one strand that comes out of um, textile production and uh, very specifically one can link it to the early work of Sophie Toiber Arp, which in fact um, did use needlework, but, but the many other um, textile arts are, are fundamental as, as the great Annie Albus show that Bryony co-curated demonstrates. So on the one hand, looking back, um, abstraction or, and particularly geometric abstraction with its grid, its basis in the grid and the interlace of weaving um, has been fundamental to abstraction from the get-go. But looking forward to, and this is partly why uh, I've become so interested in it, is there's an efflorescence, I would say, in contemporary art practice now that incorporates textiles in one form or another. Um, and there are many ways in which this is happening, but it's included um, a lot of woven work um, that is being made uh, from many different subject positions as part of a um, practices that look to explore subject positions, um, but also to take on questions to do with labor 
uh, with fast fashion, with environmental degradation that's so caught up now with um, the production of textiles today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then, um, Bryony, did you want to respond? Just uh, briefly to add, and thank you, Eliza. Um, Eliza Edelman's essay is really fascinating, and I learned a great deal with it uh, from it on on the work of Judith Luan. But I was also really struck, like Lynn, by this congruence with the work of uh, Sophie Teuber, who was obviously very present in those first two uh, biennales in Sao Paulo, you know, in some ways, um, you know, the, the full scale of her reception, I feel, in Brazil um, is so interesting, you know, given that that work was so prominent uh, there. Um, the second Biennale had a, had a retrospective that included 40 plus works of hers. Um, I discovered working on that uh, Sophie Toba show. So I, I just feel that the, 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 both the congruence perhaps of uh, two women artists who, you know, have a... Um, like Sophie Teuber, background in textile art and a kind of meeting with the language of abstraction, what, what happens. But the transnational networks are obviously incredibly interesting and important and they're tracked very, very powerfully in the book. Um, but I'm also interested just in this specific work, how um, the frame of a you know, this is needle work, but it's basically working with a geometric grid that is being worked. I mean, it's not a weaving, it's a needle point. But the way in which this, you know, this work kind of incorporates, like Sophie Teuber, you have this the kind of play with symmetry, the equilibrium, and then this real disequilibrium, the sort of shift and the, the lurch, you know, between these these sections and the relationship between a precision line and then this, that slight stagger of the diagonal. And obviously later on, Sophie Teuber, uh, well, later on in her work and work that was shown indeed in Brazil, you know, were those echelonements, which is, you know, it, it's, it's a gradation, but I mean, it basically means a stagger, a staggering you know, and these tiny staggers of those. So I, I think in in all those ways, the interlocking of um, textile practice with the language of abstraction is really important, as Lynn says, from the get-go, from the outset, from the origins of abstraction. But it's being, um, it's generating so many different possibilities and permutations by this point. Uh, by this historical point, by this extraordinary nexus of artists that are, are working in this context. Thank you. Um, I think it's interesting that Lauand was um, doing this before she kind of officially joined the, the concretists. Um, and I, I also want to just comment on uh, Lynn's point about the artisanal um, and its intersection with this sort of moment of modernization in Brazil, uh, because that's something that arose in a number of the essays, the sort of the archaic use um, of, of technique, or the use of um, more artisanal methods or anachronistic methods that um, Mary Carmen Ramirez and Cory Rogg talk about. Um, so it's something that we found um, arose in various different practices, the use of egg tempera, for example, which, you know, would seem to be um, very much um, in opposition to a kind of industrializing uh, use of materials, which, um, you know, the, the artists also did, but there's much more um, variation in um, their use of materials than just this kind of one modernizing um, um, in impulse. Um, but I'll pass it to, to Pia now to, to take the next line of the discussion. Thank you, Sana. So one of the um, other subjects that come up 
again and again in the book, but you know, also very specific to the time and that we all, I think, feel um, are very, the topics that are very important are the, um, the desire for the integration between art and life and the, the role that an artwork plays in society and whether it can be, as we said in the introduction, an, an agent of transformation or not. And um, I wondered if, um, if maybe the first question in that, um, uh, in, you know, within the subjects, groups um, should go to Ricardo because um, one of the things that I wonder about is how the social environment um, appears in your work, Ricardo, for example. You know, it is, as, um, as I said, it was a, a, a specific desire, especially by the concrete artists in Buenos Aires to create the, a seamless um, connection between life and art um, so that it wouldn't be seen as an elitist object anymore and then in the neo-concrete movement that desire was um, developed and and um, you know especially by Lydia Clark for example with her uh, work as a psychotherapist in the meantime um, it's, it became a, a, more, a lot more interactive and I wonder Ricardo if, um, if your work um, references that history in any way, or if the social shows up in a different uh, form in your work? Yeah, it works in a different way. It's not, uh, it's not specifically references historically. Um, but uh, talking about uh, that subject specifically, I think it's, it's, the, it's just the fact that I just left Venezuela in 94, went to London and spent 14 years in London, like a uh, um, in a way, I was kind of um, out of context culturally. Um, that made me that made me aware of other things. And then when I come back into uh, into South America, that it was through Brazil that I went. To, I moved to Brazil. Like everything is striking me back. Like you know, like everything everything I knew. And uh, but the social the social aspect it just it just uh, starting to to appear because I was like um, surrounded by it was it was so much of a reality just getting through my uh, my 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 work you know but it was kind of accidentally I think it was very organically um, something that happens organically and. Um, I was um, at the beginning of, of that period. I was working a lot with homeless already in London. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an experimental work, and then I went back to Sao Paulo, and it was I was doing uh, back and forth uh, trips between the two, and um, and a lot of um, and then I started to be very interested about specifically about the shelter situation, and um, you know obviously you know everything that involves um, uh, socially and politically, but also the, the, the practicality of how they, how, they, how they used to survive, how, how these people survive in an environment. So it just, I just went through, you know, naturally through this process. So I, somehow I, I don't even want it to, but it just, it just came in into the work somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we uh, will look at a couple of these particular works in a little bit later. So I'm very glad that you've um, raised this the subject already. And one other um, uh, theme that we thought would be interesting also to talk um, about in this group to today is the, the theme of the social and how it plays out in Carnival, because that is, um, it's, of course, Carnival is not uh, restricted to Brazil, Latin America, it also happens in other countries, but um, Maria Amalia Garcia in her um, essay on Rod Rodfus, who is often credited as the sort of inventor of the Marco Recordado, um, you know, Marita shows in her essay that the intersection between Carnival, for example, and the very sort of excess oriented, if one wants to put it that way, in terms of color and you know, joie de vivre and um, and creativity, that the that all these influences um, can be traced in the formation, but also in the making and in the approach uh, that Rothfuss and a lot of his um, colleagues 
uh, of the inventionismo period um, have sort of referenced. Um, and I think you also told me that when you moved to Brazil, that the carnival wasn't necessarily something you were specifically looking out for, but it, that, you know, that it is something that, um, that had a big impact on your work. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't particularly interested in the carnival, but um, I, I mean, in my, in my case, it just came through, um, uh, I think it's, it, it just came through in a different way, not, not necessarily through Carnival. But I was, um, I, I do recognize now that, that basically the culture, the, the, the popular culture, somehow it was, um, it was, it was making a presence, especially when I was doing uh, uh, new experiments with color mm -hmm. and materials, it came through um, to observing um, some situations, but, um, but not specifically about carnival. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one, one of the um, subjects that came up, you know, in the many team conversations that we had while we were engaged in the project itself was whether, for example, the fact that these um, floats and these decorations are, you know, of course, made with not particularly durable or extensive materials and how this um, sort of... Uh, much more straightforward approach to making something beautiful and decorative, whether that maybe also lowered in a way the, you know, not the uh, the level, the, the sort of artisan aspect of their making, but maybe made it easier for the artists to feel comfortable using not very expensive materials and things that might perish or, you know, degrade more easily. Um, is is this something that uh, you've also experienced that you know making artworks because it is expensive and mostly artists when they're setting out especially have you know limited means is this something that you um, also experienced and addressed in some form? Yes, I will. I will think so. But it's also um, I think it's uh, it's also uh, the materials I use. Uh, also happen to be the same materials I used to like do some DIY jobs in London, for example, to survive. So this this was this was part of my work since the you know since very early uh, years. But also the um, I always thinking or always thought about using. Um, I, I'm I'm being very very attracted. To materials that are not specifically expensive, that are materials that they have not, um, I, I would say, like a pedigree. It's like a cheap materials, like a cardboard itself. It's a fantastic material. I think it's, a, it's, it's extremely beautiful to work with it, and I think it has some. It, it carries some symbolism for me to use them because it's just something that is not um, precious. It's like the same way I, I used to work with some uh, litter or some rubbish or some debris uh, taking out of the street. It's just like, a, I just uh, fascinated by very, very simple materials and, and their beauty and their form and their shape. Um, but uh, it has like a, an, extra, um, an extra wonderful feeling to know that it's a very simple material. One of the things that we were very interested in um, with uh, Marita's essay was this kind of um, suggestion that the beginning of um, the of, of concretism in in South America could be inflected by um, Carnival. You know, we think about Oitasika's work as kind of teleologically ending in um, um, this kind of reach out to the social, but we found it very suggestive that. Um, perhaps, you know, it also begins uh, with carnival, with the vernacular and the social. So um, I guess I'd be interested to hear also from um, Bryony and Lynn about this kind of question of formal autonomy. And, you know, is that just um, an imposed um, history that comes from, you know, Greenbergian approaches or um, more formal approaches to abstraction or in, in perhaps is there an alternative narrative that we 
can uncover that's more about abstraction as um, firmly rooted in the social? Um, I had one thought, which comes at this slightly differently. There's um, <laughs> frequent mention of the role of Mondrian and in um, the essay on Rod Rodfuss, there's the comparison of one of these early um, still representational um, Marcos Rucotadas um, with a Mondrian painting. I've not, I didn't come across any of the diamond shaped Mondrian paintings. And I was thinking about those and early Malevich and the way Malevich uh, with the black square showed it high up like an icon across a corner. Um, and, and in part my understanding and the motivations for both those artists was to <laughs> develop um, a relationship beyond the frame into the containing space, um, both a, a literal space in some senses, um, physical space, but also a metaphysical one. And I wondered whether there was any um, reference to that that you had come across or whether this is a, uh, a false um, analogy that it's there's really no established connection or is it a weak connection in the term? Very interesting term that Irene Small uses when she's talking about uh, connections across fissures that uh, are not necessarily questions of influence, but questions that uh, relate to a kind of shared interest that isn't a, a, a common interest rather than um, a self-consciously shared interest. Mm. Um, I'm sure Irene might be able to um, to um, respond to that, but I, I certainly cannot. Um, I know she's here, so maybe in the discussion. Um, one of the other, um, oh, sorry, Bryony, did you want to? Yes, uh, just a couple of points briefly. I mean, I also loved um, Irene's uh, discussion of weak links. I thought that was really incredibly generative and helpful. Um, but a couple of things I was in some ways interested in the way in which, to me, the idea of the permissive um, aspect of a language of abstraction um, came out of your collaborative research. I mean, I think in some ways it seems a little counterintuitive, but the collaboration with um, researchers who concentrate on conservation issues um, have really helped to reveal in a way um, not so much the rule bound motivation but as we might intuitively um, imagine something more improvisational and I mean obviously Yves Lambois made that very important argument about Mondrian, you know, that sense of the improvisational aspect of Mondrian, that it was not formulaic, but worked out as he went along. And, you know, even more important in the context of this discussion, that was how, you know, the, the neoconcretists understood Mondrian right, if you like. I mean, kind of got it, totally got it. Even the hang that we're looking at when they're not, you know, that extraordinary kind of jolt where one falls, the other goes up, you know. I mean, this sense of, I mean, I think freedom is rather a too loaded a word, but something more permissive, which is not prescripted and is not um, formulaic, but is much more corporeal and much more temporal. And that was another aspect that came out so powerfully for many of the essays, I thought, in the book, in a really um, important way. Luis Osorio, for instance, Nico Vicario, you know, the time aspect, that this is kind of time embodied in some fundamental way um, in the language of abstraction. Um, and actually the way in which your research into the actual materials being used and the kind of oddness of it, the idiosyncratic aspects of it, 
which seemed important to me not to suggest they're all really kind of very individual artists in a sort of retrogressive way, but far from it, what seemed to emerge was that this is a collective project that could allow that kind of permissiveness. And that is all about an engagement with the social, which can't be kept out of the work. I mean, how could it be kept out of it? In a way, it's obviously porous to that social world. And I think those um, aspects of improvisation, unexpectedness, accident, sheer oddness are ways in which the outside external world and colour perhaps is paramount am amongst those material elements just kind of necessarily become embodied in the work. Well, thank you for leading on to the next <laughs> topic so beautifully because we were going to discuss colour and the sort of, as you say, permissiveness in the way um, the artists in our study um, employed colour. And so one of the um, sort of questions that has arisen is um, around the, the palettes and um, the, the colour choices that were made. So we were looking at um, the illustration from Irene's essay, which shows um, the Mondrian works at the, at the Bien uh, Sao Paulo Biennial. Um, but also um, there are many essays which deal with color in the book. And um, here we have this work by Alfredo Clito, um, where there's a sort of an uh, orthodox interpretation of, of Mondrian's palette, which is, you know, certainly moves away from um, the orthodoxy of, of um, abstraction or the purity of abstraction. And um, here, if you'd like to go on to the other slides from the Volpi, uh, yeah, so there's also this um, these works by Volpi, and um, these were one uh, works you know that really respond to um, uh, you know context in a very particular way to the Brazilian context. Um, so we wanted to kind of open up a discussion around color um, and what um the ways in which the artists in Brazil and Argentina were, were using it as a sort of marker of their um, own invention or um, inventionism you, you happen also to be showing us so many works they're all green which obviously is already kind of <laughs> that's true yeah. you know not unimportant I feel um, I mean, it's right. just, they're not green abstract works, but they're not that many, not in the proportion that you happen to be showing us on the screen, you know, with the Volpi and uh, also the Lidget Clark that's discussed. And That's true. That, that might, might have been an unconscious um, reflection. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, uh, Luis's essay on, on the introducing Burley Marx into the discussion. Mm -hmm and the not just organicism of nature and the colors of the different grasses that um, Burley Marx uses, but also the necessarily, you know, temporal aspect of the seasons that in a way are therefore incorporated into the discussion of time. Um, I mean, I don't know, it's a question in a way, but so, so loaded is, is the color green in relation to, Art, an artist like Mondrian, obviously. Um, but, you know, there is this, you know, extraordinary kind of life of green that happens in these, and I don't mean it to be only related to the discussion of, Mon of Mondrian, far from it. It seems to kind of enter into a, a very different set of associations with precisely um, uh, nature in a very interesting way. Interesting. Do you, Brian, do you also um, interpret the use of green? I mean, there is a lot more green in, in these works. I think that's also fair to say, even though they're maybe overrepresented here. Uh, but do you think that is another aspect or another example of the permissiveness that you so, you well, know- I also have it in yeah. and I mean, it's a way obviously of using secondary colors, but I think 
I don't actually know the answer to this, but I was really struck by it in, in reading the book and, and the images that you were showing, but obviously it is a, um, I don't think it's reducible. I mean, I think one of the things that is important is that you can't have a discussion of this work that's somehow reducible to um, some set of external cognates, you know, it doesn't quite work like that. So it is very much to do with the relationality of the, you know, the chromatic relations that the work is relational in that way. But uh, Ricardo, you, I'm sure you have much more interesting things to say about that, given mm. you use those sorts of uh, moments. Well, I don't know if it's more interesting or not. I mean, what you're saying is, is it's all fascinating. Uh, it's all fascinating thinking uh, about uh, around the color. I'm completely obsessed about color. I've been obsessed about color, I don't know, since early age. It's like, a, it's like something uh, that is almost driving me crazy. And, um, and, and it's funny you mentioned the green, uh, you point out the green. It's, the green is a color that, that I never used in my work for years and years. It never came in, uh, same as red. These colors that absolutely not enter into my work. And uh, the green is one of those. And um, I find out recently, I think it was, uh, uh, oh God, I forgot. It's the architect uh, from Mexico um, who mentioned Baragan. something. Baragan? Oh. Yeah, Baragan. So it was something about Baragan mentioning something that he never used green because the green belongs to the nature. And, and I just only, I, I only heard that recently. And I think that's absolutely beautiful. It's a beautiful thinking. And I was thinking maybe should I, maybe I didn't use the same because it's like a, a feel it just doesn't really belong to, to, my, uh, to my work. But anyway, somehow, it's somehow um, green starting very, very recently to get into. So I'm um, interested in green work. Uh, Ricardo, since, since we're already at the point where I think we can discuss your work in great detail, would you mind sharing with us the slides? Yes, but I don't have anything green in the slide. <laughs> but that just under, you know, underscores the point that it's a really recent uh, development. <laughs> Do you want me to, um, to um, share it? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, it's, it, I mean, we can talk forever about this. Uh, this theme about colors and um but colors in my work it goes into very different uh, uh, uh phases um so we're going to i'm going to start um showing very quickly well let's say how quickly you want me to show but um um, I'm going to start from early works. Um, I'm, I'm talking about, I, I only separate the works of the last 10 years, more or less, 10 or 11 years. And, um, and this is the time that, I'm, that I was in London, moving to Brazil, and things are starting to be like, um, I mean, I have, I have kind of completely different sets of mind to start working on different things. Um, this particular work I'm showing here is based on uh, on the early um, on my early research about uh, homeless shelters, and uh, these specific ones they were um, uh, it was a little studies about the shelter, but it's just the the the, the result. It was a very almost like um, contrary to what they were. It was a completely like kind of precious uh, little composition, but it's based on the um, on something that is uh, very very hard. Um, and the pro uh, portraits is that fair to say? Or were in there, did you um, base these forms on actual portraits of? of this, was, this was based on actual photographs that I was taking at that time, and I was taking at that time pictures, I was kind of becoming obsessed about the shelters um, in London and in Brazil and in Sao Paulo at the same time. But this was completely, um, I wasn't aware of this. I was like, uh, because I was in that time, I was using like a snapshot camera 
um, that I have to develop the negative and get back the, the prints. I used to do that a lot. So I have thousands of those. And, and I separate this group uh, that is starting in, I can't remember, maybe 2000 and to 2007. And, uh, and it was repeatedly these images of, of sheltering of something that is just something to hide um in the center of the image so i start picking up all these images and from these images i started to build up uh different ideas because i was doing photography but i wanted to um go into another medias i wanted to work with another medias and not work with another materials so painting one of those um that i wanted to kind of um have a go um i don't really think like i, I was like yeah i don't know i mean it's like I try my best uh, and I just came out with these um, type of shapes. I wanted to ask you, um, yep. Ricardo, about um, you sort of talk about yourself, your identity as like um, being a Latin American artist. And, um, you know, when you work with these abstract forms to depict, you know, a sort of crisis, of a, some a personal crisis for um uh, your subjects um, are you thinking then are you sort of working with the history of um, Latin American abstraction um, is it a reflection on um, abstraction at, um, or using abstract forms as a way to cover um, or um, I don't want to say obliterate that's a bit heavy but to um, sort of cover the social and, and the sort of relationship between um, abstract artwork and, and um, political or social environment. Yeah, I think in that specific moment, I think I was, but I was doing this, I mean, for the, uh, this is a different, uh, it's a different things mixed in, uh, mixed in, in, in this situation. Um, I wasn't aware of this fact that I wasn't doing something that hides something or like uh, it's just completely, it doesn't really um, goes with it. And it's obviously very, uh, very geometrical abstraction. And uh, one of the reasons I started to do um, these paintings, it was also because it was, I could use um, sellotape to do the borders and the edges because I actually don't know how to draw myself. I cannot really do something. You know, if I want to do like a, a picture of a painting, I couldn't do that. I mean, it's impossible. So for me, it was a very kind of easy and shortcut to do this with it, with it, with the um, with the cello tape. And I was also in this in this moment. I was also um, uh, influenced by um, some of my colleagues, friends, artists from Venezuela who were working as painters, and they were uh, they were working in sort of a way of painting so um yeah so this is the way i end up here but not really thinking about it it was very interesting for me to see it after that after it was done um moving forward um looking back is always the best uh interesting uh, discoveries of my work i think yeah, I mean, um, sort of going back to the subject of obscuring or covering, but also to the subject of color. I wonder if you could maybe um, go a little forward in your slides to yeah. the pieces where you use concrete, um, poured concrete to pour, you know, a rectangle, a rectangular shape on top of very strongly colored neon type colors. And I wondered if you, yes, these, these ones. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you arrived at those particular hues? Please. Well, those hues, they came, they came across from uh, previous works that I was doing uh, before this one. And, um, and I, was, um, I was a little uh, uh, kind of, I was playing, I was playing with something that I saw in Miami years ago. And this was a huge, massive graffiti in one wall, massive, gigantic, um, that it says, uh, we live in the rainbow of chaos. Um, I mean, this is a well-known um, 
uh, phrase by Zezan, and I didn't know that. And I, but I was like, kind of for, for that moment for me it was a very important to kind of encounter these uh, these uh, these uh, words because that's in a way that was the way I was feeling myself um, between uh, between a very complicated. Uh, um, uh, uh, let's say uh, societies in a way that you know is full of conflicts politically and stuff, and and then you have somehow kind of a a way out through some kind of harmony. So these 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 colors come from another one previous that I was doing. I was starting doing sequences of colors with the rainbow. Uh, but it was my own taking of rainbow. It's just completely different. I mean, here you see is another colors that doesn't really match, or it doesn't really go in much order. Um, so I wanted to do the same with the concrete pieces because the concrete pieces they were like, uh, for me they were like a little monochromes annulated by the concrete. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I placed them in that position. Mm -hmm. And I think you were describing to me in another conversation how there's also a, a variety of textures. So the, the polyurethane that makes up the colored part, which you tint with great diligence and patience and a lot of um, passion, <laughs> it you know, tends to dry to a much smoother, not perfectly smooth, and you know, but not perfectly uh, smooth like a cow hood or something, but um, that the comparison between the glossy and smooth color background and the concrete which you pour but then kind of let settle and I think in the, one of the previous slides one can see that quite beautifully how you get and even in this one big variations in color and um, how how you know can you talk a little bit about why you um, generate this strong contrast or maybe it just feels like a strong contrast to me yeah that's one like this well you this is, I mean, this, this was part of my own research about the materials and the, cla and the clashing materials in between something that is, as you said, is a kind of a very smooth and pristine, and then another one which is a very rough. And, uh, and this is what I want to do as an experiment of, of, uh, of putting these two together, because the way I have to pour the concrete, then I have to make the mold. So the mold is supposed to be on the sides where all these little holes are. And um, so that was a way, kind of almost an excuse to, to, to reveal the original surface. And it's the only surface you can see because the back is just covered with concrete. Um, but this is the same process I was using with the paintings, which is uh, doing construction over the boards of the wood and screw them in and then paint and paint and then just destroy back and, and um, reveal the original uh, the original structure. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers, but that's what that was. That's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we should invite um, any uh, questions from the audience at this point. And whilst um, we're waiting to see if anyone has questions. Um, I wanted to kind of pose a broader question, which actually came up in conversation and is probably uh, Bryony's question. <laughs> but, um, you know, we wanted to sort of finish the discussion by thinking about materiality and the question of materiality. Um, and and Bryony put it very nicely that, the um, you know, what's the material of materiality? And like uh, we found that often when we talk about materiality in this project, we were sort of at cross purposes. Sometimes some, someone's talking about materials very specifically. And so I wondered, um, uh, perhaps we could start with, uh, with Bryony since that was her question. Um, you know, when we talk about materiality, uh, what are we referring to? Um, um, or, um, and as a, as a sort of concept, is, is it useful um, when we're thinking about this uh, work and, and more broadly in terms of abstraction, like what is it about abstraction that, um, you know, is so particularly um, apt to this, uh, this term? I mean, I, I think it's a term that's become um, very important. It's, it's, it's used um, a lot and in a way there's a, 
a set of agreed meanings, I think, of the term materiality. But I was also trying to, you know, in response to, to your book, which I think raises a lot of questions about that relationship between material and materiality again, you know, which I think is, it's important to keep in mind those questions rather than kind of assume the relationship. And, you know, for me, I was kind of reformulating it slightly just to myself, which, you know, I think what's important to me about materiality is it is a kind of a, a condition of being a material in the world. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, a material in the world with contingency, you know, so it, it's kind of that sort of conditional um, aspect of it, um, mm -hmm. which means that its meanings can, the meanings of a material can be very unstable, mm -hmm. um, but they can also be psychic. They could even be mystical if you want to, you know, or not, or social, you know, it is that sense of their potentiality perhaps, but mm -hmm. I think in a way that comes out very strongly in the book, that sense of contingency. Mm. And so the history of the reception as well, because it's difficult for us looking at these objects to understand what something, uh, how something meaned in that, in that context. Mm. Um, and uh, Lynn, did you want to respond to that? I, um, I fully take the point that Bryony made the other day about um, the material doesn't exclude the social. In fact, the material might be being galvanized in relation to the social or sense of issues generated um, from the social. But that said, I'd also um, just want to make the point, and it really comes to thinking about the, um, the trio of um, contributions that make up this book, the conservation scientists, conser conservators, and art historians, and how over the past 20 or 30 years, I've, I've noticed that those um, interdependencies become more and more important to in-depth studies of an artist over. And I'm thinking of um, maybe 20, 30 years ago when uh, monographic exhibitions, really in-depth studies, whether it was of say Barnett Newman or Brancusi, there began to be contributions from conservators or conservation scientists within the catalog. And uh, they, I think with the Newman, which uh, the show I'm thinking about was Anne Temkins at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And the fact that the whole exploration of what, um, which works were to be chosen and how the checklist was to be set up in part depended on the condition of the paintings, that whether mm -hmm. they were, how they were now in relation to when they were painted and what changes and how changes could have made them um, unfit for, con for inclusion. And in some kinds of abstract painting, we depend very much on knowing what we're looking at, whether we're looking at something that's radically different from the, from the terms in which it was made, from the form in which it was made. So I think that um, in, in a more localized way or a more circumstantial, described way, materials, um, materials within materiality are of ever-growing importance. And as more experimentation is done with materials, those questions only become uh, more urgent. So uh, for me, one of the great contributions of the book is, is the way in which these groups of scholars and specialists have come together and illuminated that in, in um, extraordinary depth to great purpose. Well, we have one uh, question who just came in um, from Nicholas von Barter, who um, was father, you know, as we know, played a, a huge role in bringing um, especially the Argentines' works to Europe and to our um, awareness and consciousness. And Nicholas is asking whether 
this is to the panel, um, when we talk about materiality, what contributions do you think sculptors such as Emu Yomi made um, in this context? I, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but perhaps Lynn, because you are a great um, sculpture specialist. Um, does anything come to mind when you think about the more proper, you know, proper sculptural aspects of materiality? I, I think we're almost in a kind of a situation or, or have been for half a century now where categories of painting and sculpture as discrete categories are um, difficult to maintain. There's so much fluid, fluidity. And um, while there's been tremendous exploration within the realm of sculpture, I suppose one could say, um, I don't think it's particular to sculpture. Maybe, maybe I've got the question back to front, but um, yes, I just leave it at that. <laughs> I think I, I, I'm not 100% uh, correct. I think they just know much better, but I think in you, Yomi, other than other artists in the same group, really focused on sculpture, whereas um, uh, Millet, for example, and you know, some of the other sculptures were um, quite fluid, as you um, were saying, and definitely didn't feel the need to be one or the other. In fact, one discipline, of course, informed the other. Well, I wonder, looking at the time and knowing that um, Bryony for sure has to um, leave us um, right now, I wonder if now maybe it's the time to wrap up and um, thank everyone for being here, for being so generous um, to share their thoughts. Thank you, Lynn, Bryony and Ricardo. Thank you also. Thank you, um, thank you very so much. Then, um, if anyone in the audience has questions that come up after, please um, let us know and email us. It's, um, it's easy to find us on the web. But thank you everyone for attending and, um, and have a wonderful evening. And um, we hope we'll see you soon again in another context. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.